talking more about obstacles also, you've, you've talked previously about how these cases are prosecuted in the military justice system in a way that would just never fly in the civilian justice system. Right. What have you seen? Um, well, a lot of people may not even be familiar with the fact that um, the military has a separate justice system. A lot of people don't, don't know that. Um, I'm sure, embarrassingly recently, I didn't even know that. Um, and they operate under uh, the Uniform Code of Military Justice, which is a separate, a separate legal code. And that um, kind of guides all the behavior um, of the military. Um, you know, a lot of people see this as being necessary because of the circumstances under which the military operates um, are very different than in the civilian world. Um, but when it comes to military sexual assault, it creates a lot of uh, complications. For example, um, perhaps something uh, that people in the audience have been following, there's been a lot of debate lately about reforms to the military justice system because as of now, um, commanders have the power to decide whether or not to prosecute a military sexual assault case um, when it's reported. Um, they decide whether that case goes forward, um, which may be shocking to, to civilians that a commander who knows, often knows both the accused um, and the accuser, because they're both under, uh, under that person's command, um, and, and sometimes there's been some research the commander would be the alleged perpetrator of the crime. Um, but this person gets to decide whether or not it goes forward. Um, so a lot of, some, several members of Congress, uh, Christian G uh, Gillibrand most notably, has argued that these cases should be taken out of um, the chain of command because there's obviously there's an undue influence there, there's a bias there. So that's just one example of the way in which you would, if, for example, if a, a sexual assault was reported at work in the office, your boss would not be the one deciding whether or not that would proceed, um, you know, would go to criminal proceedings. It's just not something that would happen. And in addition, once it, once it gets there, um, which it's a, a sad small percentage of cases that do get to court martial proceedings um, in fiscal year 2012, it was something like, um, I think they said that 66% of cases, um, and this is cases that they decided they had jurisdiction over. So it, I think it was 2,000 something reports and 1,700 or so they decided that they could move forward with that they had jurisdiction over. And then of that number, 66% went to court martial proceedings, but that doesn't even necessarily say what will happen after that. I mean, sometimes these cases will result in a fine as happened most recently um, an example that got a lot of people's attention, there was a brigadier general um, from the army, which is, this is one of the highest ranks, that, this is one of the highest ranking people in the military. Um, and he you know, had a very significant role in our most recent wars. Um, he was charged dozens of, there were dozens of charges in this case, his name is Jeffrey Sinclair. And um, one of the, among the charges were uh, accusations of sexual assault, sexual harassment, um, possession of pornography, and misuse of funds, et cetera. And in the end, he accepted a plea, bar plea bargain and he was fined $20,000. When at the beginning of the trial, uh, initially he could have gone to jail for life. It would, would have been a life sentence. So people see these results and, and they wonder if we need to have reforms to the military justice system, if they can appropriately handle, um, handle these cases. So those are just a few ways in which the military justice system differs from the civilian justice system. I, I do want to note that um, assault cases are very difficult to prosecute in both the civilian system and the military system. Um, but there are specific factors, I think, that make it more difficult for the UCMJ to appropriately handle these cases.